So who is your father? You think that's a pretty straightforward question. Um, I'm, I, I'm reading through uh, Luke at the, at the moment, and I was struck as I studied this passage that there was more to it than maybe I'd presumed from learning it in the days of Sunday school. So I thought we could look at it together uh, this evening. Uh, who is your father? It was a difficult question for this guy. Uh, so uh, Kevin often says he's a child of the 70s. I'm a child of the 80s. So, um, but for Luke Skywalker, it was a very difficult question because his father also turned out to be his arch nemesis, uh, Darth Vader. But for most of us, uh, this question is fairly straightforward. But for the for the 12 year old Jesus, it was a bit more of a challenge, both for him and for his immediate family. Jesus answer to this question it guided his sense of identity. Um, it guided his relationships with those closest to him. And ultimately, it guided the path of his life. And, and we can see, hopefully, from this passage this evening, that it's also a key question for us. Who is your father? Or to put it another way, do, do you know God as your father? So Luke is the only gospel writer who records this story, and it's likely to have been recounted to him by Mary, uh, much like uh, the rest of the kind of uh, nativity account that, that, Luke, that Luke gives us. And the purpose of Luke's writing is explained uh, to his intended reader, uh, Theophilus, early, earlier in, in the book. And uh, in chapter one, in verse four, he says, the reason he's writing is so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. And that's why Luke gathered these eyewitness accounts and uh, to, to give his readers evidence for the true identity of the one that we claim to put our faith in, evidence to the deity of Jesus, evidence that Jesus is who he said he was, that Jesus is the Son of God. And so the passage we're looking at tonight fits into that. Luke has put it in the gospel as part of that evidence. And in it, interestingly, he records the first spoken words of Jesus. So listen out for those. And, uh, and he reveals that even at this young age, Jesus knew who his true father was and sought to be obedient to him. So, so we begin. And we begin, and it's festival time. Okay, it's festival time in, in Jerusalem. And this was an annual pilgrimage uh, for Passover. And it was about an 80 mile walk. I don't know when you last walked 80 miles. Maybe, maybe Jonah will on his Duke of Ed one day, I don't know. But 80 mile walk from Nazareth to Jerusalem. And we, we don't know if the whole family went regularly or maybe it was just Joseph went regularly. This might have been the first time that Mary and Jesus had been back to Jerusalem since the events of the previous chapter, whenever Jesus was presented in the temple as a baby. But this time, this time Jesus was coming as a 12 year old boy coming of age. And as we can see, as we're gonna see, he was he was aware of his identity. At the end of the festival, the Nazareth party of extended family and community locals gathered and started their long trek home. And they probably traveled in a large group for, for safety. And Luke doesn't, he doesn't present it as unusual that, that Joseph and Mary had not seen their 12 year old son for a day. It seems strange to us, but doesn't seem unusual then. But then we read that the anxiety starts to, starts to grip them. Uh, verse 44, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Jesus, was not to be found. 
among relatives and friends. Where is Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? Then the realization sets in. He's not here. Nobody has seen him since we left the city. You can imagine a little bit of what it was like for Mary and Joseph. There is nothing quite like the parental anxiety of a lost child. There's probably a room full of stories here about lost children. I remember Jonah went missing maybe for about 10 minutes once in a playground in Northern Ireland. And I was searching for him and the anxiety was gradually building. And then you find him and he's like, I was never, or even in the, in the, in the London Transport Museum, one of you went missing for a while. I mean, we had to get a, you know, one of the staff to try and help us. And, and, and the child was found in the play area, not lost. You know, why, why were you looking for me in the rest of the museum? I was in the play area, you know, so yeah. But there's nothing quite like the parental anxiety of a lost child. Mary and Joseph were going to have to go back to Jerusalem, searching, worrying. Where were they going to look in this busy festival city? Population normally 70,000 or, or around there, bigger than Tunbridge Wells, and then boosted by a whole festival. So where were they going to look? They thought they'd lost Jesus, their precious firstborn son, this son who had some amazing divine purpose that they didn't really fully understand. They thought they'd lost him. And they started looking in Jerusalem, but unfortunately, they were looking in the wrong place. So they go searching, but in the wrong place. J Jesus hadn't been lost, uh, but the temple was clearly the last place that they expected to find a lost 12 year old boy in Jerusalem and searching in the wrong place, as we always do at the start, uh, makes the anxiety worse. It's helpful maybe to step aside here and think, well, if a, if a friend said to you, where can I find God or where should I look for God? What would you say to them? Where would you point them? A lot of people in the world are searching for some greater sense of purpose or meaning in their lives. I have, I have a friend who recently went on a yoga holiday to India, looking for meaning in empty meditation. Where should people look for God? Well, we know that God is revealed in creation. God is revealed in, in humanity when we live the way we were designed to live, when we live lives of love, when we live lives of worship. We are created in his image. We are his image bearers. God is revealed sometimes in the miraculous. God is revealed in answers to prayer. Among some peoples and in some places where there's limited access to the Bible, God reveals himself in dreams and visions. But God is revealed most clearly to us in the Bible. And that is clearly where we should point people to. And that's primarily because God is most revealed in his son, Jesus. God, God hasn't made it difficult for us to, to point people to him. He's given us a person to point people to. He is the one to whom we must point people. Searching for God, look to Jesus. Look to the man Jesus. God incarnate, God become man. So many waste so much time looking in the wrong places. But look to Jesus. In him, we see the fullness of God's character and how he cares for his people. So let's not look for God in the wrong places or, or point people in the wrong direction. Jesus is the one to look to. Remember what Paul uh, wrote in, in Colossians chapter one. He wrote that the son is the image of the invisible God. 
For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. So a bit like John the Baptist was, may we be signposts for the world who are searching in the wrong place. May we point them in the right direction to Jesus. And where are they going to find Jesus? They're going to find him in the words in the Bible. So we take up the Bible and we say, come read this with me, look at it with me. Um, let me let me introduce you to Jesus. So after this searching in the in the story, we find three surprises. We're going to find surprised teachers in the temple, surprised parents at the location of their lost son, and finally a surprised Jesus who didn't even know that he was lost. So in in verse uh, 46 and 47, we see that while his parents were desperately looking for him, Jesus was amazing the teachers in the temple with his questions and with his understanding. So even as a boy, Jesus was devoting significant time and intellect to the study of the scriptures. And we just have to take this as an example to all of us, not just the young, hello young, who who thinks of themselves as young, Uh, an example to all of us. Let us make this our priority as well, devoting time to reading and understanding God's word to us. It's God's word to us and for us. Jesus clearly enjoyed discussing things of God with the older generation, and and that's something that has blessed the church down through the ages, Sunday school, Bible class, all that, and it continues to be a blessing here among us in this church. As we move on to the the next verse, uh, verse 48, we find the surprised parents. Finally, after three days of searching, they find their son. We don't know if they were searching in Jerusalem for three days or if this was the third day after they realized he was lost. The, the text isn't totally clear. But anyway, after three days, they find him. And we can tell from, from Mary's words that uh, by the time they find Jesus, they are exasperated. Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Isn't it strange how we always find things in the last place we look? But clearly that the temple was not the first, it was not the second, and it wasn't even the third place where Mary and Joseph looked. Finding Jesus in the temple was a real surprise. And Luke doesn't, he doesn't gloss it over these words ring very true, don't they? Uh, An anxious and upset mother, and uh, many mothers have have said words just like this. So this is a a true account. It hasn't been sort of dressed up for us. It it, it rings very true. And just as as, uh, Mary and Joseph were surprised, Jesus was also surprised. In verse 49, why, why, why were you searching for me? The, the teenager says, uh, why, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? So he wasn't, he wasn't surprised because he'd been found. No, he was surprised that his parents were looking for him at all. He was surprised that they didn't know where to find him. Didn't you know? I had to be in my father's house. Didn't you know the son is beginning to teach the parents? Uh, and that's a bit uncomfortable. Um, as parents, when our, when our children pull us up on something that we've maybe got wrong, um, it's very uncomfortable. We're supposed to be the knowledgeable ones. Uh, it can be a bit jarring uh, to be told by your child that you should have known better. Maybe some of us 
fathers have uh, experienced that from the back seat of the car um, <laughs> or other places like that, but it's especially jarring if the child is correct, if they're right. Um, and, you know, Jesus was right, but this was, it was the, it was the beginning, we've just seen the beginning of the relationship changing uh, from, the, from that more typical parent-child to, to the child is beginning to reveal things to, to the parents. And, and, but as we see in verse 50, Mary and Joseph did not understand. They didn't understand yet. Um, and understanding would come later. And really, understanding was going to come later with a lot of pain. But that's, that's for, for another time. So they, they didn't understand. But let's, let's take some time to focus on, uh, on, the, on, on the second part of, of Jesus' answer to them. Um, and that question of who is the Father. So um, we're going to look more closely at verse 49. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house. So Mary, um, Mary says, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And Jesus seems to counter Mary's statement with what sounds like a, a correction over the identity of his father. Because Jesus says, I had to be in my father's house. So earlier in, in this gospel, Luke, Luke presents Joseph as Jesus' father, so it was thought. So Luke paints the gospel of, or paints that message of, of Jesus' father and, and of the parenthood of Joseph. He wants to clearly show us that, that actually Jesus' father was God, that Jesus was the son of God. So he puts that doubt in, uh, in chapter three, verse, verse 23, he was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. So Luke is using this story, evidence like this, to present God as Jesus' true father, thus helping his readers to have certainty of the things they've been taught, that Jesus truly is the son of God. And in, in verse 49, the Greek is tricky. Forgive me, I'm going down heaven's, Kevin's route here. The Greek is, is tricky because the, the subject of the sentence is actually missing. So it's been filled in a bit by the translators because what it actually says is, I must be in the of my father. That's what the verse actually reads, which is a, difficult to translate. And, uh, and so the translators tend to put in, I must be in the house of my father, which is where Jesus was, or I must be about the affairs of my father or, or doing the business of my father. That's, that's how it's translated. So, uh, so there are, but the overall emphasis is clear. The emphasis is on the father and Jesus was now clear on his purpose and he could articulate it to his parents. And that was to honor God first above all things, and not just God, because Jesus is identifying God as his father. Jesus was aware of his true identity at this tender age of time. We don't, it's, we don't really know how aware Jesus was or when he became aware of his full identity, or was he aware throughout his childhood? Not totally clear, but we know at this stage, the age of 12, Jesus was aware that God was his father and he was putting obedience to his heavenly father first. So, and for Jesus, we can see in his behavior that, that part of what this meant was that he sought to understand the scriptures from an early age. And we see the fruit of this both here and, and later uh, when Jesus is teaching and using the scriptures and when he's using the scriptures against the devil when he's, when he's tempted. So, Again, we see that priority for us about seeking to learn the scriptures, that our relationship with God, so much of it comes from learning the scriptures and, and being, uh, just being, uh, yeah, just get, get, we just can't get too much of, uh, of being in God's word and learning it under Jesus' example. Jesus was becoming aware of his true identity and he was allowing that to shape his priorities and his choices. So what, what, what about us? 
We're asking who is the father of Jesus? And then it brings us to a question, who is your father? Who do you see as your, your father? If we're believers in Jesus and the Bible teaches us that we are adopted into God's family, we are, it's almost hard to believe, hard to even say it, we are co-heirs with Christ. It takes a bit of sinking in that, that statement and we'll, we'll maybe look at it, look at it again. But um, Paul, Paul makes this clear from what we read in, in Romans earlier. Romans chapter 8, he's talking about the identity of believers in Jesus who are filled with his spirit. And we'll just, we'll just go through this. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship adoption to sonship and by him we cry abba father that's that tender you know the abba is the is the tender dad or papa that kind of phrase and that's that's the relationship we're being given with father god that's the relationship jesus had and it's the relationship we can have the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are god's children now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So what's an heir? An heir is someone who stands to inherit, who stands to inherit the title or the estate. And, uh, and we are heirs to the estate of of God the Father, we are we are heirs in this in the family of of the King, um, and and that is that is really worth thinking about uh, and allowing to to sink into us so that it can actually change how we how we see ourselves, how we uh, see our identity, and then it begins to affect our our choices and our actions, like it was doing to to Jesus, the twelve year old boy in this story. So if you're a believer in Christ, are you aware of your true identity? That you can call on God like the perfect dad. And that may be the perfect dad, the perfect dad that you never had. You certainly didn't have a perfect dad. You may have had a great dad. You may have, have not had a good relationship with your, with your father, your earthly father. But God is the perfect dad or the perfect father that can be called on by us at any time. So it's worth taking time to consider that if we're believers in Jesus, as, as Kevin's been teaching us in, in the mornings from Corinthians, if you've missed it, pick it up on YouTube and um, let us pray and ask God to help us to become who we are, to become who we are, allowing our position as children of God to reflect, uh, to affect, sorry, to affect our actions and our attitudes and our decisions. Do we truly believe that we are adopted into this family? We are not slaves with no rights, forced to try and please God. If our faith is in Jesus, then we are beloved children of the Father. We're, we're in the place of honor, and so we serve him. We don't, we don't serve to a, to a slave master. We serve because we're in that place of honor. We have full access to the Father. We have access to God's throne room at any time. And as the perfect father, he delights over his children. It's hard to believe that sometimes, that God delights over us. We are subject to his loving discipline, but never his outright rejection. We are the focus of his delight, not of his employment. So perhaps in the week ahead, as Christians take time to reflect on these verses, um, and we may come back to them on, on Wednesday evening, on your relationship with your loving 
Father. He cares for you. He's responsible for you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he's chosen you and he has forgiven you. You're an adopted child of the King with full rights to a glorious inheritance of eternal life. Let's move on to the end of our story. And uh, it's a picture of submission. Verse uh, 51 and 52. He went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So the story finishes with a, with a note to a model of childhood or teenage submission. Adulthood was to come, but, but while Jesus was dependent on his parents, he was submissive to them. Uh, not easy, but the best way. And Jesus, of all people, he did, not, he did not have perfect parents, and he actually did know best. He actually did know best, unlike uh, some of our uh, children, but he chose to submit. He chose to submit. Um, so let's not immediately land that on the children in the congregation and say, you must submit. Let's land that on ourselves and say, all the more reason for us to submit to God. All the more reason for us to submit to God, our Heavenly Father, who always knows best. So in conclusion, Luke gives us this account to reveal both the genuine humanity of Jesus and his deity as the Son of God. Mary and Joseph were looking in the wrong place. And like many in the world today, so let us be a signpost, maybe be a signpost for them pointing to Jesus. And at the age of 12, Jesus decided to put his faith first. Uh, he was secure in the knowledge of who his true father was. And we too can know God as our father. And, through that, and that's through what came later as Jesus obediently went to the cross. We can be adopted into the same family as co-heirs. So may we truly live in that identity, rejoicing in our forgiveness, our relationship with our perfect Father, and our certainty of our hope of eternal life with him. Amen.